Um, so what you basically did is we moved the buildings away um, according to these factors and um, also moved them up to the vertical meters um, above the flood lines. <coughs> The current sandbar location 
and of course the New River flow with the Howe Train in the background running parallel. Now I'll turn to Garabo who will discuss the sandbar relocation over time. Okay, bringing change is good. As long as the change you bring doesn't change the change that was bound to be a natural change. Which is standing before you this morning around here to discuss the few causes that might have led to the same cost and the river. Now, if you look over here, you actually see that the river had a small island at the 10th September 2006. But then moving along the timeline, you realize that that very same small island started to disappear. Now, what could have, what could have caused this? This might have been caused by uh, soil erosion, which might have been caused by uh, wind and the and, uh, current coming up from upstream. Moving along, since the since the uh, <laughs> that island has been been destroyed, obviously the sand from it and the soil from it is going to move downstream, which will start to accumulate over here. But then the problem is that is directly in front of the moor, and also it could be a danger to life that is there. But then we all know that uh, nature will try to rebuild itself, and obviously it will start to plant more and more vegetation on the soil that is there in the river. And then there you can see a beautiful image of nature after it replenished itself. But then surprisingly enough, the very same island that was once destroyed is now back. How? Uh, this obviously could be done by the fact that uh, before. The, before the Khaochun was built, the lake had no such things. But then during the construction, such, miser such, uh, uh, such things started to appear, whereby the stunting is destroyed, and then after a few, after a few months, it starts to reappear again. So my team and I assume that maybe the people who were building the Khao train might not have found a beautiful spot to dump their soil, rather they dumped it uh, upstream, not realizing that obviously the soil they dumped in there is going to go downstream. So, since nature tries to replenish itself, uh, it actually planted uh, vegetation. But then the problem with vegetation is that it can rot. So, the more realizes and uh, made up, uh, tried to make up for it by using perfume. But then that is the same as saying that we want to go to the sun, only you're going to do it at night to avoid the heat. Obviously, it's not going to work. <laughs> uh, this, the area still smells. Now, obviously, since the mall had been, had been built inside the refrigerator, so when the floods come, it's going to be a danger to people. And so previously, my colleague showed you a place that had been closed out due to the floods. And then this has uh, evidence that the area just flood. Now, this shows clear evidence that man holds a key to the sixth great extension. Now, if we do not combine our heads and our brains, we're obviously, we're obviously going to cause it in a lesser time than predicted by those scientists. Now, for the community. In conclusion, based on what we gathered and what we researched, um, our team believes that the building of the house train is in direct correlation to the reflow of the river and the modern location of the sandbars. Thank you. Uh, shapes show where we conducted interviews. The concentrated uh, red parts 
so when we took a picture and we were walking around in there and we took a picture there, okay, this layer, orange one, you know, greenish, shows where the area of the centurion, or even here the bath in Texas. <coughs> Okay, this one is a global temperature map which shows an increase in the temperature from 1960 to 2014. As we know that uh, we have been experiencing global warming. In South Africa, in this period, we have, uh, our temperature has increased by 2,5 degrees Celsius, which has made our rainfall pattern to be very strange and unreliable and also unpredictable. As such, uh, with the rainfall changing, the central mall also uh, got the impact as uh, still accumulated during the process. Okay, over to the next speaker. Uh, vegetation changed around the central mall. As you can see, before it was more greener and uh, there was a lot of vegetation. But now there's less vegetation and it's no longer greener. It's Someone will ask, what is vegetation? Vegetation is just a ground that is covered with plants. We all should treat vegetation with a lot of respect because we all depend on it for many, many purposes like food, shelter, and medicine. Um, our, these pictures were taken near the Centurion Mall and as you can see, there's less vegetation so if the earth heats up, it will be more hotter than it should be because there are less trees that will help it absorb the heat and less oxygen provided. Changing the head of river into the Centurion Lake has not, has not been a good choice thus far by the evidence previously stated by the speakers. The change resulted in the pollution of the lake and the bad smell. With the accumulation of silt and increase in oxygen level due to the rapid increase of algae that is growing near the lake has resulted in plant death. This has released methane, which is a very harmful gas and which creates the horrid smell. The lake has been polluted by the sewage, sludge, and litter from the surrounding areas. Over here, we have a perfect example of the land pollution that is occurring in the Centurion Lake near the Centurion Mall. The accumulation of silt, which I previously mentioned, is stopping the litter from areas such as Tanvisa, Ivory Park, and others that is flowing into this Centurion Lake, now known as, I mean, previously known as the Hanoks River. The accumulation of silt stops the litter from flowing through thus creating pollution in the lake and creating pollution in the scenery of Centurion Mall. The water and the soil is polluted. There is close to no plant or animal life on the, in the lake and the evidence shows that the developers or builders did not consider the potential impact of their actions. For if they did, this would not be occurring. I'll give this opportunity to my next speaker. Um, um, the main question here is, what factors contribute to flooding? Um, we actually had a lot of answers to these questions, but um, we couldn't actually point them all out because of time efficiency. Um, a wise man once said, if you can't explain, if you can't actually explain it simply, then you don't actually understand it well. Um, the issue of the Centurion Lake has continued to be uh, the main uh, problem which actually affects the, the businesses and even the environment. Sources have actually spoken that um, the businesses in the Centurion Mall has to close up because when it floods, the water level rises to such an extent that the to such an extent that it goes up to the buildings, which leads to the uh, some businesses having to close up. Um, yeah. As you have heard and will continue to hear, a lot of these changes were preventable. If the developers had looked at the environment and thought about what could happen, none of these things would have happened. As the South African Constitution says, everyone has the right to have the environment protected for future generations. It is a universal challenge to better plan human 
Lossi Park, I'll see you on Lossi from me, Masai Kosovian Imperial School, Chef Moore, that's based in Gumalana. And then I'm Lukina Mashala from Midrand High School, which has been Midrand. Mm -hmm. And then that's Graham Roy from Pretoria Boys High School in Pretoria. And last but not least, Emily McCallum's Deport <laughs> Manual <laughs> High School from Lucifer. Okay, um, in the world that we live in today, people make big money, but they don't care about nature. And like this was one of the many calls that we received when we were doing our survey. So in a way, we were actually disturbed. But in any case, my team and I decided that we're going to focus on how evangelization has an effect on the Centurion Bay. Centurion Bay, what is Centurion Bay? Centurion Bay is a man-made lake just, just behind Centurion Mall in Victoria South. This lake was built in the early 1980s. And as means to add some facades to the new shopping center. The process involved the widening of the head of Surabaya. By looking at the map of Centurion Lake, it is clear that something drastic has happened. The blue lines represent the man-made walls of the lake, the yellow lines represent the river flow in 2013. The red lines, as you can see over here, are the GPS tracks recorded by the team right as we were taking our recording our information. Now, the problem starts at the source of the Hennels River, which lies in the center of a fairly large rural community called Timbesa. Due to poorly maintained sewage systems and no proper rubble removal, Timbesa serves as a high source of runoff, erosion, the runoff from Tembisa converges with a six mile spread that comes off of Ridfler Dam. Ridfler Dam has got clean water and is located 12 kilometers up from Centurion from Lake, which is somewhere over there. The conversion of the Hemlock River and the six mile spread is at a small museum known as Smuts Museum, situated there. That's near Kumoyo, which is right up there. This conversion increases the speed of the water, mm -hmm. allowing it to carry silt and sediment, waste and pollution down to Centurion Lake. Due to Centurion Lake being a man-made lake, this forces the fast flowing water from the Enox River to slow down to accommodate the space, to fill up all this space over here. Now, as the water slows down to, to accommodate the space, this gives time for the sediment in the, in the river to slow down and to accumulate on the, board, on the bottom of the river. Now you can see over here how we've mapped out using QGIS the, the sediment layer, slowly building up as the river as the well, as the river opens up to form the lake. So today this problem will just keep getting worse unless something is done. Uh, as you can see, the riparian zone. Uh, first of all, the riparian zone is the space between the land and the between the land and the or a stream. Uh, it's <coughs> uh, it, it works as a as a buffer. It protects the surrounding environment, and uh, it protects the surrounding environment from ex from excessive seals, uh, mass pollution, and erosion. The riparian zone is vital in keeping the water quality high uh, and protect the wildlife. Here in South Africa, the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry stated that on minimum, the current zone should be no less than 20 meters. 20 meters. Uh, in in St. John Lake, uh, the current zone, zone is about 10 meters, of which is not right, uh, meaning that the buildings are in the current zone. So it's not safe, uh, the, the buildings can fly, can fly when they are flat. Uh, as for the wildlife, uh, the, the lake is, is polluted, uh, meaning that fish die, uh, the, the vegetation die, uh, and bees are moving out. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a loss from, from the Centurion Lake. So some people came here to, they, they were coming here to, to view at bears, bad lovers, and some at the hotels, they, they like to wake up with, uh, with the sound of the bed outside. So it's a, it's a loss. 
because of the population. So, um, in addition to being a safety hazard for the birds and other wildlife in the area, Centurion Lake is also harmful to the human public. In its creation in 1983, Centurion Lake had one simple task to attract outside consumers to the area. You know, a beautifully done building right on the waterfront should have, should have done you know, tons and tons for the local economy. But it's now, a little over 30 years later, it's completely lost. Uh, when asked about the lake, many shoppers would snarl their noses and comment on the smell of the unattractiveness of the lake. Many even uh, said openly that they tried to avoid the area. Um, when people refused to enter a certain area of the shopping district, it makes it extremely difficult for the shop owners of that district to keep their doors open. And uh, at times like these, we literally cannot afford to shut down our commerce. In addition to the troubling effects Centurion Lake, Centurion Lake has had on trade, Recently, a children's plane has been set up right on the waterfront. A woman we interviewed named Charlene told us that she was very uncomfortable with the idea of her, of her daughter playing down on the waterfront and said that she thought it just was not safe. And the issue here is, is that she's correct. You see, Centurion Lake emits something called methane gas. Methane gas is called it is in a fixed a fix season, meaning it has the ability to suffocate and to kill. A large intake of methane gas are known to cause oxygen which has such serious symptoms as respiratory problems, collapse, emotional outbursts, even death. With such small children running around, it can, kind of, it can be difficult to identify these symptoms. You know, what with children being small, we tend to think they out, have a lot of outbursts. You know, um, we assume we do, that's just something we assume. But oxygen deprivation can lead to long-lasting damage to the brain and other vital organs, and one misconstrued tantrum can turn into a lifetime of disability. However, despite all this danger, people are still coming to Centurion Mall. A large portion of the people we approached were actually experiencing their first time at Centurion Mall. And when asked about Centurion Lake, many of them responded that they didn't know there was one. Um, uh, it's also been let loose. The Centurion Studio City Project plans on spending about 16 million rand for the construction of the uh, largest building in Africa right here on the Centurion waterfront. Uh, many people believe this will be a step in the right direction, maybe get the place a little bit cleaner. But personally, we believe that it will be further urbanization and worsen the situation. At this moment, people don't know what's going on in Centurion Lake. And as a man in GK Chesterton said, it isn't that they don't see the solution, it's that they don't see the problem. Before we can effectively, practically, and realistically better the situation at Centurion Lake, we need people to realize the dangers they're putting. We have managed to find a company who specializes in central Europe in lakes, ditches, or rivers. This company is known as AES Europe. This may sound like a breakthrough in terms of the solution, but this method would be highly expensive to complete, and the harsh truth is that the lake would just silt up again. Another solution is to try, allow the, to try and allow the lake to revegetate, and then allow the river to flow naturally through there. This will allow for a high water velocity to carry the silt without leaving any deposition. Um, you can establish a park on the banks, which can be open to the public, in turn, create a economy for the centurion mall. Finally, money could be given to the poor to the poor Tembisa area to improve social services, which could make the situation on the centurion lake by reducing pollution, erosion, etc. Thanks very much. Oh, 
lake is directly proportional to the negative index the, the lake has on the mole. Here we have two uh, maps of lake in June, one in 2001 and the other one in 2013. When looking at these two maps, you can identify that um, in 2001, the lake was wider and there was like more water compared to the one in 2013. I'll now hand over to my team and they will elaborate more on what's really happening. Okay, so just some background on Futuria Mall. It was established in 1983 and was located between Pretoria and Midrand along the N1 highway. And it was purposely located on Centurion Lake just to attract people because it's beautiful scenery and then people could have uh, lakeside restaurants and people could sit outside and the stores along the way. So it was really just a big attraction and it was actually one of the first shopping malls with big name retailers in Pretoria, which just added on to like the glory of the mall when it was first um, implemented. And then it underwent, it underwent major renovations in 2003, actually due to flooding. Because prior to 2003, it was built on flat land. So during the summer and even in the winter, when it had major um, like downfalls of rain, all of the water would stay within the stores. So they would have to close down for two to three days at a time just to get all the water out. So in 2003, they actually reconstructed the whole mall and put in kind of a, it's at a slope, I don't know, the last time you guys went to Centurion Mall, we were there recently, and you kind of are walking down <laughs> like that. And so what this does is when these huge rainfalls come, all of the water just goes down the slope and it ends up in the uh, lake. So this um, mitigated the flooding in the stores. And so some effects the mall has on the lake, um, a big part of it is mall runoff. So one type of this is um, impermeable surfaces, and that's like when they implemented um, a parking lot or even the store floors, which are like tile and asphalt. None of these things absorb the water. So when they have these big rains in the summer, all of the water goes down the newly made slope and ends up in the lake. And while it's doing that, it's picking up chemicals, trash, cigarette butts, anything that's been on that floor. Um, along with that is air pollution. Because it was such a big attraction, there are more cars and buses coming through in that concentrated area, which is bringing um, more like carbon dioxide and other harmful chemicals. And so it all ends up in the air above the lake. And so when the fish come up or any other type of animal that's in that ecosystem and they get air, they're bringing that polluted air back into the lake. And I know a previous group talked about this, um, the smell that comes with like the rotted uh, vegetation, they tried to cover up with odor cure spray, and it's actually sprayed right above the lake. So when it's falling, it lands right into the lake, which just adds to the pollution. So it's really a big problem. And then one of our interviewing questions um, was, how do you see the mall five years from now? And we asked a young lady who was shopping there, and she said, I think the only option they'll have is to start building over the lake. So this just shows that like, right now the lake is already having problems, but then in five, 10, 15 years from now, where is the lake going to be? It could be built over, it could be not even there, it could have been evaporated or just killed off. And so this kind of shows that it, it is a problem that we have to address. This is our map that we have with QGIS. Um, we were able to get our layers from the database. It was all Once it was all compiled, uh, we uh, labeled how it was important, and uh, this is the overall how this uh, form our uh, hypothesis. So the yellow line that you see here is uh, how train, the blue line is uh, the Pennox River, and then the green areas the centurion buildings that are affecting uh, the river flow, and then uh, the red lines are roads that are affecting the Overflow and the areas are dry the so. But I made this map to show that the infrastructure affecting water flow. <coughs> As you can see, the, these roads and the half train are going straight across the river. The roads, for example, um, a lot of car drive passing, so there's a lot of trash and litter that falls from the from the roads into the water. 
and the half shape, and there's also pollution from the car going into the river, causing more less flow. And the half shape also affects the river because it builds right over the river, and even more rubbish falls into the river. These buildings attract our businesses, which attract more people, and a lot more trash in cars, which causes the river to be polluted even more. And that's how the river has been deteriorating over time. And I'll now hand over to you. <laughs> um, here we have a few presentations from the people we are interviewing at the mall. A young lady said um, the lake isn't affecting the mall in any way. And an, an old man said a bus takes me here every week and I eat lunch with my wife. This is my favorite mall. And um, an, another young lady said I don't want to teach you to make any more. I kind of teach you as well. And your worker said, um, the river doesn't belong to the mall, so it's not our responsibility. And a young man said, the smell is not appealing. So basically, um, there are positive and negative effects of the lake, and there's a huge difference between the youth and all the people, because like, they find it more, like they value the lake more compared to the youth, because like, they don't really like, recognize the lake and they don't get it more than the like, Kenya. Yeah. So yeah, it's basically the work of a child to like way out yeah. The older generation appreciates. <laughs> so um Kathy just talked about how like people view the lake from the surface, how it's like still looks like a pretty lake in the sun. But then here's what's really going on. <laughs>
and you're left with pollution and barely any water left and horrible scenery and the smell, uh, as has been earlier described, it's just a disaster. And then the other issue with the placement of the Centurion Mall is that it was built uh, within the floodlines, which means all the time that the stores are flooded and then um, the Centurion Hotel, which is uh, located close to the Centurion Mall, was even have to be evacuated in 2011 for all this flooding. So it could be easily fixed if they just had built outside the riparian zone, away from the floodlines. Um, so definitely that is what needs to happen with future building plans. Another thing is water pollution, which is contamination of water bodies, which lead to the air pollution in Central uh, Mall, which clients and the stores complain about. This is caused by the spillage, bath, and trash dumped into the river simply because it is situated between Buildings. All of those factors lead to, the, to this terrible outcome from building the wall this close to the edge of the river. So in this image, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but that is the edge of a mall. There is water flowing underneath the mall on a regular day. This is not any sort of flooding. There is not any excess amount of water, and there is water underneath the building, which is just completely horrible building planning because, you know, as soon as it floods, water gets all over the place and it's just disastrous. As you can see, the trash, for example, bottles, the papers, the, the, the place is trying, trying to, down, to dry out and the vegetation, which is pretty sure that there is the front mouth drying out, which is stinky. That leads to the wall to the stinky. Mm. <laughs> The destruction and improper development of places such as the once beautiful Centurion Lake will continue to happen unless we do something about it. Well, instead of trying to fix or revive the Centurion Lake, a large building plan is a large building is planned over the river. The river is said to be over the excuse me. The building is said to be over the river, which means that this will further destroy any remaining ecosystem. The mall was built within the flat lines and restrictions, which shows that the law enforcement on building criteria is still lacking. Instead of still, excuse me, instead of trying to cover up the river, we should be coming up with um, solutions to solve this problem, and maybe we can solve, we can save this ecosystem and others like it. Uh, that's um, this right here is a table of our interviews, which we used as primary data, and we used it as a reference for all our ideas. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you very much. It's just like it's, it's 
Centurion is located on a high fault, which is an area or a region which is at a high altitude. And it's just like Johannesburg and Pretoria, which experience summer temperatures which vary from 30 degrees to, to the mid-20s, and winter temperatures which vary from 5 degrees in the morning to 20 degrees in the afternoon. This is because of the high pressure during winter, this is because of the high pressure system that is dominant over South Africa, and in summer it's because of the low pressure system that is dominant over South Africa. Um, the Hanap River is the river we studied um, as it flows through the heart of Centurion. Um, ask yourself the question, how when we look at um, Centurion Lake, the question we ask ourselves is, how the lake looked like when it was a lake and not a river. Um, this Google Earth map was taken in 20, 2005 and it shows the all before it was um, one of the as the lake was the lake, was the lake but then not a river. And it shows the all before it was built. It served as a drainage area, which is an area where all the water, so all the water comes in. And it also serves as an ecosystem for um, plant life and aquatic organisms and live in a variety of bird species. This, this map shows the gradual decrease in the size of the Centurion Lake. As you can see here, this is more narrow and this is like a river. This is still the river, it's not even the lake. So the mall was supposed to be built around the water source, but then they used rocks and boulders to change the flow of the water. This had an effect on, on the, uh, the catchment area, as it served as a catchment area for sediments and um, pollutants that are being carried by the current of the water. So this also had an effect on the type of organism that's, that live on the area and the type of and the alien plant species occupied the area and resulted in the river current that becomes in control of the during heavy rainfall. And it's changed the, um, the type of current from turbulent to um, laminar, which means smooth because the rock and soil that is, that is being eroded um, by the river is moving over a smooth and even river. Again, good evening to all. Um, this map right here is the map compiled by my team and I have assistance by showing. Okay, okay. This map was compiled on the quantum GIS 2.0.1. Um, in the plus four days. Okay. What we did is that we took a satellite layer from Google right, and then we added the points, lines, and polygons. And this over here is the Centurion Lake, which is part of the. Which is part of the Hinnops River. This is the hard train station in Centurion. This is the actual Centurion wall, which has a major effect in the decreasing of the standard of the Centurion River. Okay, and these are nearby buildings and an office park over here. The bridge is over here, and over here is the Centurion Lake Hotel. These points, these red points over here, are what is where um, most of the military is accumulated around the Centurion Lake. Where, whereby um, where the points which accumulate mostly to create 
and the points that the cumulate was are actually the ones which are closest to the to the lake, which is more of a bad case, okay? And then over here, this is more okay, you can say more is an average accumulation of litter, but then you have a quite a huge increase as you go along over here. And then on the further on the outskirts further away from the lake you have less. It could be it could be better if there were more if there was less accumulation of litter closest to the river. But better all if there was no accumulation of litter. I just have a quick question. Around, around the lake, either around or inside the lake, how many times or how many pieces of trash per year do you think is deposited in the river? Just a guess. Like to say. Environment has decreased. Um, all of the contractors said that 
it would be a great place for them all um, to develop because of the great water feature, but they didn't do all of the research. So, as we wait for this to load. Oh, yes, on Thursday when we were at the mall, we questioned some people, Katie mostly questioned people, and then we tried to go around to the offices in the mall to try to figure out <laughs> <laughs> Um, to try to figure out kind of the history and the background of the mall and what has gone on. Garbage being dumped along the hydroxyl 
deliver each day that affects natural resources. They reflect them. There is an ethnic on top of them and uh, it supplies the Pujan region with water and the dam main pieces for municipal and industrial use. So in this case, uh, the dam the dams like have a bad impact on the weather. This is actually the map that our team came up with using QGIS. And here we have mapped uh, the waterways around the Cintron area, and maybe all the important um, areas and buildings around which may ha have an effect downstream. And that was the main focus of our map, was to see maybe what was happening upstream that could have an effect on the downstream areas. And as you can see, we have a, a, couple, of, a couple of factories, including the freaky equipment, and some of the projects actually make mining equipment, and they actually pull water from the river to help pull, pull it their machines. But actually the, the most interesting thing that we found was there's a dairy farm just here and a dairy farm processing plant right there. And the actual really neat thing is that they use um, artificial growth hormones that can actually soak into the water and, and actually on um, the wildlife. And I, I, know, I know about this because in my home state um, we have an issue with um, uh, birth control hormones which are affecting um, it, it gets into the water systems and actually are causing frogs to um, change genders. So that's, that could be a good thing. And 
uh, harder to get around and make it more of a challenge to build up over top of like club lines and stuff. Then that way you're eliminating the problem at the source. Um, in terms of how the buildings be farther away from the club lines and from the club lines and from the right periods of areas that can be damaged. So if you make the city planner's office aware and figure out you know what can be done to make buildings to make it harder to build buildings in the wrong places, then that would be a good solution for not having this happen in more areas. Anybody else? Thank you. 
for, but that adding a map and doing some scientific research and adding scientific data to your analysis and to your research boosts your argument and certainly strengthens the conclusions that you come to. And it means that you then have a much more powerful tool with which to make an argument to the various entities that you that you were mentioning you might then want to uh, speak to. Would you agree with that? So maybe just to inform you guys um, that we went through the process of all all the teams who presented their work to us. So unfortunately we just missed that. Uh, it was fantastic. We just went through a QA session about about you know their lessons and scenarios and possible solutions. So Typical of younger people, they have brilliant ideas. <laughs> and they cut through the red tape. <laughs> and if you give them the opportunity to probably get things uh, done much better than us. There was, there was a, one of the presentation, I think the last one, we talked about the biggest building in Africa, superstructure. And it is true, we have a 2050 plan for Chuan. Right? And within that 2050 plan, we talk about the, you know, the urban development growth, the zones. And one of the plans is to build a super, like Abu Dhabi style, you know, uh, skyscraper and then a country center in Centurion. So based on your kind of information you're learning over the last nine years, good idea, bad idea, and please, if, if you, the pros and cons, why? Maybe you could, okay. Okay, for building the, that's, guys, sorry. Sorry, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself again, because we're newbies. Okay, okay. I'm Where are you from? And I'm from the Princess Hall College in Victoria. Okay, building the skyscraper in Centurion, I think it's a bad idea because the area is on the dolomite rock, which is sensitive to the pH of the water. So if it's less than seven, then that rock dissolves. <laughs> so you wouldn't want to build some uh, a structure, big one, on rock that is safe. Thank you. Um, 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 and the project, 
I don't think that it's both good and also a bad idea because firstly, what's the good thing about it is, okay, it's fine, it's catching, it's going to create economic, economic growth, create employment, rise in the GDP of the country, but then on the other side, the thing is, our country is a suffering nation. We, the majority of the countries is underprivileged, it's mostly in the, like maybe 30% of our country is primitive and don't have, they don't have access to technology and those kind of things. I think there's bad and good. Sorry, thank you all very, very much. Once again, another round of applause for a brilliant presentation. <laughs> the effort and the kind of enthusiasm you all shown. What is really encouraging is the fact that within the groups you had you know, four or five members, but everybody contributed. So that was really nice. Um, now we're on to the formal, formal part of the program. And um, to allow me, please, Indulge me to go through the formalities and then invite our guest speakers. And so, way of saying thank you for being here. So, uh, let me just start formally by saying to the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, Mission Virginia Palmer, representing the U.S. Embassy in South Africa, Professor Potkita, and Dr. Lucia, representing the University of Pretoria, um, the Young Tux Program, Kandila Manozi, representing the Association of American Geographers, <coughs> Bernie Yunus, and Peter. Ray McFerrin, I'm going to call you to say anything, Ray. But Ray McFerrin representing the CSIR, uh, Bridget and Gavin Fleming, big round of applause for Special Peter Franklin uh, from Pretoria Boys High. Boys High? Boys High. All the brilliant chaperones. Uh, On behalf of EIS Africa, the local host organization um, for the GCE Michael U Camp uh, for South Africa, we'd like to place on record our sincere gratitude to the US Department of State, the AEG, for choosing South Africa as the location for this tech camp. Um, so why are we here? Well, I naively agreed to partner with Patricia Soleil from the AEG um, to develop a proposal to host one of three youth camps along with Bolivia and Panama. I repeat, very naive. Uh, the pessimists in me thought this would never, we would never be selected, and then EIS Africa as a struggling NGO would be closed, so this would never happen as well. Uh, well, I should have known better. Uh, Patricia, if you get to know her, is a brilliant person, and she made this all happen. So, unfortunately, she's not a to us, but please come be our sincere, humble thanks for all her energy and and crafty for putting this all together. Um, but when this happened, I was quite panic stricken because I have worked at the national level, I've worked at the continental level, and I've even worked at the global level with many of the kind of leaders in the community. But working with high schoolers is certainly out of my comfort zone. <laughs> Serena, I'm terrified I was when I met her. <laughs> and we were, we were actually this year, really accidentally, uh, managed to use the superb Flemings. I uh, met with Ryan from the embassy over a couple of coffees and uh, I said, please help. Um, met, and then through Gra Graham uh, McFerrin, who I now work with, we got me to tag along to meet Serena. And this discussion with Serena said, please, I don't know where to start. She introduced us to Peaches and to Ferdinand Young Tux, and things just happened. Just, you know, we've got this like, kind of your uh, perfect crack team. And, and, I, and I mentioned that opening ceremony. I believe it's the best South African people. And I think maybe you thought, what is he talking about? But after nine days, I'm sure you all would agree that this is really a good team. And uh, you know, we couldn't have done any better. So um, to all of you, I'd like to say a big thank you. And I can honestly say that I've uh, never worked with a group of uh, more passionate, hardworking, and positive souls. And I would work with every one of you in a heartbeat if I had a chance to do so in the future. To all the students, um, this was about you. He said this, and I think everyone's probably going to say the same thing. Uh, and we sincerely say that we've seen you grow over the last nine, about the past nine days, and I believe that this experience is going to have a positive impact on your life. Yeah, you know, the friendships you make, or even you know, some of the IT skills, the fact that you call Gmail accounts, I think it's all going to be good. Um, 
And then to our schools, particularly we have one representative, but the time representing all of the schools here, um, that gave you permission for you to start the academic program late. As you know, some of our schools have started, and we thank you for that. And often we get, you know, I think uh, Bridget mentioned, kids are representing their schools on rugby or cricket tours. You know, they're not marked absent for the day, but you're attending a science tech and then you suddenly have to you know, be absent and all stuff in the register. And one of the, one of the students here has a perfect attendance in the register. And he was very worried that that impeccable record would be would, 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 would impacted. So hopefully, that's not for the real. Please make sure he doesn't get absent there, but thank you guys very, very much. Um, then finally, to our colleagues again from uh, representing AG and Embassy, uh, we hope we have fulfilled our responsibilities professionally. And if we have failed in any aspect of hosting this camp, we do sincerely apologize. We hope too that this won't be the last time that we can partner with you and promote the value and role of geospatial information science and technology in Africa. Thank you all very much. to introduce Deputy Chief of Mission representing the U.S. Embassy of South Africa, Virginia Power. Once again, I'm not going to do justice to your, to your bio, but Virginia is a clear member of the Senior Foreign Service. She began her duties as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Pretoria during August 2011, with the departure of Ambassador Donald Gibbs. Her previous post was in Hanoi, where she began as Deputy Chief of Mission in August 2008. She was also the deputy coordinator of the counterterrorism from September 2005 to May 2008. Prior to that, she was the director of the East Asia Bureau Office of Economic Policy. She was the economic counselor of the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. And she's done tours in Beijing, Hong Kong, Harare, Calgary, the office of the Margaret Affairs, and the operations center in the State Department. She has an MA from the University of Virginia and a BSFS from Georgetown University. She speaks Chinese and French. Virginia and her husband, Ismail Asmal, also a foreign service officer, have to know this. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a privilege to be here. Um, that, that slightly boring resume um, doesn't tell you probably the most important thing about me, which is that I came to South Africa as a high school um, I was an AFS student and went to St. Mary's School for Girls. Um, sort of in the bad old days in 1979. So um, I've seen South Africa change and I, I bow down before that change. And, and South Africa has had a change on me. Um, so I think, you know, to, to come together as young people as you have come together over the last nine days is, is something beyond science and technology that will shape all of you. Um, it'll shape the way you feel about South Africa, it'll shape the way you feel about the United States, I hope, and um, it'll shape the way you feel about the world and working together in it. So I'm really honored to, to be here and, and to celebrate your achievements with you. Um, I, I need to also say hello properly to Professor Paul. What can I do? Professor Galinder. And, and to thank the chaperones and the people involved in the tech camp for making this possible. Um, EIS and um, and it's just been I think a remarkable experience from what I hear and I I talked um, on the way here about your presentations and what they meant and I was struck by how broad they were. Um, in fact, when we talk about the role of science and technology in diplomacy, you think, well, why does the embassy care about science and technology in Africa? And I think there are a number of answers. Um, the first answer is that it helps us to have evidence to undertake policy decisions, um, to make decisions about what we do in our world. And in South Africa, we use that every day, for example, with our PEPFAR program, which is our five billion US dollar program for HIV and AIDS. We use science to, to think about what programs work and where we should spend money and where we can cooperate with South Africa. Um, world leaders, sadly, have been using it in recent months to talk about chemical weapons in Syria. Um, and in the last couple of days to talk about the crash of the Malaysian Airlines jet over Ukraine. Um, and, you know, in order to avoid the really dire consequences of that, we have to use scientific methods to investigate what happened. So science and technology really are important in the world. And, and I'm struck with your, your answers to the last question that I heard. Um, 
how you brought economics into the debate, how you brought aesthetics into the debate, and art. You know, a skyscraper doesn't look good unless surrounded by <coughs> other other skyscrapers, and, and unless the environment around it is better. Um, so all of those things figure into us making the world that the way we want it to be. Um, I think the other sort of theme about that that's important is that science and technology issues are global. That they affect the way your community interacts, the way your family interacts, but they also affect the way that we Americans interact with South Africans, um, the way that South Africa interacts with the world, and what we can achieve together if we cooperate on the science and technology globally. Um, and I said hey, that brings me to sort of the beginning of what I said, which is that science and technology collaboration um, makes the world a much smaller place. Um, and science and technology collaboration is often easier to achieve than other forms of collaboration. It's easier sometimes to have a problem that you can take apart together and that you can benefit from another country's knowledge or another country's approach to come up with a final solution which is meaningful for both of you. And when I served in China, um, as the professor noted, we had really, really good science and technology cooperation, and we had good space cooperation. Um, and that helped us, in fact, when we were fighting about a lot of other things, including currencies and economics and human rights. And, and the kind of trust that you can build by cooperating together scientifically, by sharing information when you have a disease that threatens us all and you need to share your samples, um, can really help us build trust that builds relationships in other spheres, spheres too. So I think the, the work that you've been doing over the last nine days is really important in terms of the results of the projects that you presented, and I'm really excited about those, but I think it's also very important in terms of the kinds of collaboration that you've built with other South Africans um, and with your new American friends. And, and as a diplomat, I should also say that I hope you will all be ambassadors um, for each other's countries um, when you go home. Um, Emily's comment about the way that Americans think about Africans um, isn't a comment about Africa, it's, it's a comment about how parochial and sometimes ignorant Americans can be. And, um, sorry I'm embarrassed to say that, but it's true. And um, I think to go back and talk about how sophisticated the people you were dealing with here are, um, and how wonderful South Africa is, and how different South Africa is from other places in Africa will be very educational for, um, for your American fellow students and, and teachers. And, and I hope that the South Africans that are here will go back to, to Limpopo and say, oh, those Americans are not so bad. So I really do um, congratulate you on, on what you've achieved the last nine days. I should talk just a little bit about the other things that the U.S. Committee does to promote science and technology cooperation. Um, we have bilateral science and technology cooperation agreements with more than 30 countries in the world. Um, the one in China that I was talking about is very important. In Vietnam, I served, we worked a lot on dioxin remediation, which is getting rid of the effects of Agent Orange that was used in the Vietnam War. Um, and that has big implications for the health of Vietnam, but it also has implications for how Vietnam and Africa can get on and operate 30, 40 years after the war. Um, we have a, a joint, it's called JCM, and I can't remember what it stands for, with South Africa, which is increasingly active. Um, this year we started to have cooperation in health, we have cooperation in space because of your square kilometer array. We're just signing a memorandum of understanding with NASA, um, which is our space agency in South Africa. So all kinds of science and technology cooperation is occurring, and that's just going to go from strength to strength. Um, we also have a science envoy program. So we have distinguished American scientists that go all over the world. Um, and they talk about what their research is, but more importantly, they're building relationships with other scientists and government officials who support science and technology. Um, and we have fellows that come and stay in the embassy that work on, on various things. So if you have an idea and you want us to dig in with South Africa about something, let us know and we'll try to get a science fellow out here to work on it. We also have a Fulbright program. So we send um, 8,000 U.S. and foreign students back and forth to, um, to study in each other's countries. And we have a program for teachers. I'll this for the school representatives that are here. 
We sent six um, <coughs> teachers in math, science, and English um, to the United States to study pedagogy and spent one program was four weeks, one program was two weeks um, in the U.S. And all of that is on the Ethicist website. And um, in South Africa, there's a lot of smart science women in this crowd, I can tell. There's a program called Tech Women. Yeah, let's have a little fun. Um, which, is, um, well, which encourages um, young professional women in the sciences to travel to the United States to shadow top female scientists um, and participate in their research and discovery. So um, I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to help, you, um, help present for, <coughs> for your work over the last nine days. And I hope that you'll stay in touch with your American friends that you've made over the last nine days and that you'll stay in touch with the embassy. And um, we won't forget you. Uh, we'll invite you to things, and um, there are other programs that you can participate in as you go forward. So congratulations for what you've done over the last nine days, and good luck with your achievements.
very grateful to you. We hope to see you again in other venues and at other times. I'd like to thank all the chaperones, those that are still left in the room. Um, some of them we had to say goodbye to earlier today. You were wonderful mentors to all of the students. You bridged a lot of cultural and linguistic gaps, and you helped us really grasp the materials that were being covered so quickly in class over such a short period of time. I think all the students really benefited from your one-on-one -on -one interactions with them. And a special thanks to the AG fellow in the CAIA, who also helped us a lot with all of these new concepts and a lot of the communication and, and, and grasping the, the details. And I, of course, can't ignore or, or not mention the keystone to all of this, which is my colleague, Marcela Zavallos, who a lot of but also in terms of content, guiding the students, leading us, and getting us through this tech camp as well as all of the others. Marcel is a key component to all of the three uh, GC tech camps. So I really think we have, yet again, created a community, and we are dealing with challenges to our Earth. So I do think that this 12-year-long program that was launched in Johannesburg in 2002 is continuing to fulfill its mission and is doing so um, successfully because it's a formula that works. We do care about our communities and we do care about the earth. And if we get together in manageable groups around an issue <coughs> from different cultures and backgrounds, we can come up with solutions. You've proven it this week. It can be done. So I'd like to thank and congratulate all of you again. Welcome.
many have we been? 30 all together? 39. To all 39 of you, the invitation to consider the University of Pretoria as the institution of choice for your further studies. Even if you are choosing to study in the US, our visitors here, think about a semester to come in and study with us. There are all sorts of exchange programs available. Not only that, if you don't want to come for a full semester, think about your summer and spending that here at Skienza, maybe as an intern or as a, in support. Come back, visit us, uh, invite our students across if we you can find a way to, to extend the relationships that we have got. Um, and, and with that, I, I really would like to congratulate you once again and wish you well for everything that you undertake in the future. Yeah. <laughs> 